Peace, 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 peace. Power to the people. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our third webinar, Let the Neighborhood Speak, 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 Speak. We are back live with another great webinar brought to you by HALA, High Lives We Go Together. HALA and their comrades are presenting a five-part webinar series through Facebook Live to share widely with multiple communities across different geographical spaces. This webinar series stands on the analysis and roots of the non-traditional approach to criminal and social justice and human justice. We bring forth the energy and spirit of our ancestors and ask the elders and youth from the neighborhoods most impacted by criminal incarceration and the punishment system to come forward and join us. We invite the spirit of grassroots community-based organizations, funders, and local leaders to come through. These webinars allow us and our communities to deepen in political education and to grow our power within local neighborhoods. We hope to generate community-specific approaches to wellness and liberation that we can use for resistance and healing. Now let's take the time to uh, do a ritual, a libation, where we bring our ancestors in uh, and grind our space um, by saying our ancestors' names. And I start with the Black Seminoles, the Gili Gigi people, Gabriel Paza, Denmark Bessie, Nat Turner, Harriet Tubman, Marcus Garvey, Storky Cormichael, AKA Kwame Ture, W.E. Du Bois, Fanny Lou Hamer, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr. Ella Baker, the Freedom Riders, Fred Hampton, Bunchy Carter, the Black Panthers, the Black Liberation Army, Las Zapatistas, Thomas Nikunde, Eddie Ellis, the founder of CNUS and one of the co-leaders of the Green Haven Think Tank. We invite you all to think of who you're inviting into the space. And as we do this, we honor the indigenous land that we are on and the legacies of resistance and courage deeply seated on these soils. Thank you for grounding that space, Mickey. Now, uh, now that we brought our ancestors and elders into the space, I would like to acknowledge, uh, uh, now that we brought our elders and uh, ancestors in the space and acknowledge indigenous people, I want to take a minute to explain some of the non-traditional approach to criminal social justice research. The non-traditional approach is a grassroots analysis cultivated from the study and the experience of Afrocentric and indigenous youth community organizers who served long-time prison sentences in the late 1960s and the early 70s in the New York State Prison. These organizers also facilitated the Attica Rebellion in 1971 as an action to announce the horrible conditions they faced in their communities and in the prison. They then later, in Greenhaven facility, created the Greenhaven Think Tank, who began to study, do research, and outreach to colleges, organizations, and city council members. The non-traditional approach research purpose is to address the combat and the disproportionately large number of Blacks and Latinos being placed under the restraints of the criminal justice system. This research is grounded in a historical lens that is rooted in the Afro and Latino central perspective that examines the development, transition, and correlation between plantation and prison life, tracing the events of incarceration from slavery up to the present. Their data also shows and states that 75% of the New York State prison population comes from seven neighborhoods, which made up 18 assembly districts in New York City. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. Um, so in today's conversation, we're gonna focus on young people um, and people directly living in and from the seven communities and neighborhoods that make up those 18 assembly districts. Brownsville. Bedford-Stuyvesant, East New York, the Lower East Side, the South Bronx, Harlem, and South Jamaica, Queens. 
These neighborhoods have been directly impacted and targeted because of systemic inequality going back generations. We're not saying that other neighborhoods like East Flatbush, Bushwick, Queensbridge are not impacted by this criminal punishment system. Um, and in fact, we do believe that the, they experience the seven neighborhood reality. Um, and so we're using this as a lens. The NTA research was created in the 70s and 80s. Um, and that same data and political analysis continues to support our work today. Since the seven neighborhood research study, there's new data um, that show additional neighborhoods across New York State feeding the, the community to prison pipeline. And we invite people to think about, if you're not from New York State, how this shows up in your neighborhoods and where y'all are from. Thank you, Mickey. Appreciate that. Um, and now, you know, let me introduce myself before we, you know, go any deeper. Uh, Alex, my pronouns is they, them. Alex, Altoro, Love, P. Um, I'm a healing justice organizer and legacy leader with Hala, how I rise and go together. Uh, I come from a legacy of a lot of great women who struggled and sacrificed. Uh, a lot of my family come from Grenada, Honduras, Mississippi, North Carolina, and the beyond. Um, and I was born and raised in Brooklyn, Crown Heights, it's Flatbush, Best Eye, um, and I could keep going in many other neighborhoods. But the same thing, like, I have also experienced the hardships and the conditions of the war on Black and Brown and Indigenous people. Uh, I am also grateful to the legacy of hip-hop and Black music, uh, which helped me find a way to heal. Um, and through those practices, I became an MC and songwriter, um, and I go by Al Toro. Thank you, Alex. Nah, thank you. Such an honor to be here with Alex today. Um, so my name is Mickey, I use she and her pronouns. I live um, and have lived in Crown Heights for over 10 years. My family is from here. Um, I rep Crown Heights um, as well as just being born and raised in New York City. Um, recognizing what it means to be from um, an immigrant family where I um, grew up in a mixed status family, um, which really pushed me into my organizing and my youth work at the age of 14. Um, and it is my privilege to be able to be a youth worker and a community organizer um, and a design doula um, that really um, seeks to um, envision what it means to actualize liberation in our lifetime and to think about the joy and power um, that our communities and especially our young people deserve right now. Um, and we're so excited to be here today. Um, Alex and I were reflecting um, before this session and grounding about um, the power um, and also all of the things that had to happen for us to get to this point in this moment um, to be able to be co-hosting and co-facilitating this panel. Um, but y'all, we have an incredibly brilliant, powerful, just, y'all not even ready, like just the most brilliant and amazing young people today with us. And so we're so excited um, to be able to introduce you to our panelists next. Um, and also to honor um, all those who are listening in and take, taking time either in this present moment or in the future um, to listen into this conversation. Um, we do see this conversation as leaving evidence of our resistance, of our brilliance, um, and of all the ways that we're re-envisioning um, the communities that we want to be a part of. And so up first, um, in our panelists, I would like to introduce y'all to Nana. Y'all gonna see Nana in a second. Um, so Nana is a magical writer, mentor, holistic wellness explorer, and dreamer from Brooklyn, New York. Um, she uses her, she, and sis as her pronouns. Um, and she's a girl from Brooklyn. Um, as a first generation American to her Malaysian roots, her experience as a black girl was equally unique. She found her voice through writing and presenting black feminist think pieces in her high school. And from then on, she slowly learned how to better express herself, understand herself, and navigate the world through herself. Today, Nana serves as a magical writer <laughs> um, and exploring and dreaming in a human friendly world. Welcome Nana, we're so happy that you're here with us. To Make 
amazing. Um, our next um, person who hopefully will have an opportunity to join us a little bit later, um, her name is Giantia Spears. Um, Giantia, Giantia was born on the west side of Chicago of Kedzie and Douglas. Uh, Giantia is a music lover, a former dance performer, gaining her passion for dance. Um, she believes that black women are powerful in mind, body, and spirit, and that healing for our sisters is important. One of Giancia's gifts among many is empathy and the ability to censor um, and connect with people in space. Um, Giancia, thank you for all of your work, your magic, and your brilliance that you're bringing here uh, from Chicago. Uh, thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, and peace, Nana. Peace, Giancia. So glad um, to have y'all with us. Uh, and I'm so hyped to be introducing our next two panelists. Uh, this brother right here, uh, I'm so appreciative uh, to get to know him and uh, just to be in his life and his presence um, in this journey. Uh, I want to introduce to you all uh, Pakash uh, Churman, uh, founder of the Free Pakash Alliance. Pakash Churman is 21 years old. His pronouns is he and him. He was born and raised in Jamaica, Queens. At the age of 15, Bacash was charged as a juvenile offender. His trial was unfair, which led to a wrongful conviction. Bacash was incarcerated for six years, one month and 10 days for a crime he did not commit. Bacash is out on bail while being electri electronically monitored for the first time in over six years. And he is also fighting his case. Bacash has been organizing with others like Howler and other organizations to apply as much pressure as possible on the Queen's DA, Melinda Katz, to permanently drop all charges against Bakash. Uh, so please, let's introduce Bakash to the space. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm so glad to have you there. And with that, let me introduce our last panelist. Whew. So, so amazed by this sister. So glad that um, we are uh, thinking to journey with each other uh, for so long. Uh, my Asia Clark, y'all, uh, is a healing justice organizer and CEO of My Asia Bodega of Beauty. My Asia joined Hala in high school to give back to her community. After hearing some of the co founder stories at Hala event, it inspired her to get help with her father, who was incarcerated at the time. Through Hala, she was able to impact many through healing justice and helping people confront their traumas as well as her own. She is now an owner in business called My Asia Bodega of Beauty. So peace, Ma. I'm so glad to have you here. You know, we definitely family. Uh, and I know people are going to be so amazed and inspired to hear you speak. And now with that... You know, we in question one. <laughs> and really, um, you know, just want to ground us um, and getting to know uh, everybody here. So please, um, Nana, if you can, please tell the world and us uh, a little bit about yourself, who you are, the work you're doing, and what legacy that brought you here today. All right, y'all. Well, um, hey, my name is Nana Samake. And like Mickey said, I am a girl from Brooklyn, born and raised, and I'm a first generation American, right? Um, my parents are from Mali, and I'm the first in my family to be born here, so my experience is a little different um, from other people. And basically, the work that I do is that, you know, I do contract work with nonprofit organizations. Um, mostly grassroots organizations, some big ones, um, where where basically youth voices are needed. Um, so I just show up as a young person, and I just like put my input like where need be um, on how to help young people in society. Um, in addition to that, like I do volunteer work. I um, oftentimes like engage in healing justice as well. Um, and like mentoring young black girls um, is something that I love to do, something that I've always wanted as a kid. Um, so that's my way of giving so I can receive um, the dream of a human friendly world. Um, 
And the legacy that I'm bringing with me today um, would be the spirit of Maya Angelou. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah. Ah, uh, wow, nah, thank you so much, Nana. Uh, spirit of Maya Angelou, thank you for just dropping that bomb on us like that. <laughs> Appreciate you. Uh, Bakash, please tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, uh, the work that you're doing, and the legacy that brought you here today. Uh, hi, everyone. First and foremost, uh, uh, I want to I wanna, uh, take this opportunity to thank Holla for this beautiful opportunity to you know raise awareness and um, continue doing the work that we're doing. Um, my name is Prakash Chairman. I'm 22 years old. I was born in Guyana. Raised in Queens. I was kidnapped by NYPD at the age of 15 in Jamaica, Queens for a crime I did not commit. I was gruesomely interrogated for hours with an illiterate parent that didn't know any of her rights just as much as I did. Um, and I suffered. I, I was forced to languish in jail for nearly four years to await my first trial. My first trial was unfair, um, which led to my wrongful conviction. I immediately appealed my conviction. I had to wait in a prison for a year and a half for that decision. I received that decision on, on June 24th of 2020, and a New York State Appeals Court overturned my conviction and ordered a new trial. I was transferred back down to Rikers Island last year, July. I remained on, on Rikers Island for months. Um, in the midst of a pandemic. In October of last year, I got a new attorney assigned to my case. In November was the first time I appeared in front of the same judge that made this improper ruling in my first trial. We requested for him to set reasonable bail. He denied that. Um, at that point, my attorney appealed his decision on the bail um, in the same appellate court that overturned my conviction, granted me bail for the first time um, in, in over six years, in, in the entirety of my case, on December 17th of 2020. Uh, they granted me bail at $150,000 cash or bond with the conditions of electronic monitoring. On January 19th of this year, I was bailed out from Rikers Island at approximately 10 p.m. Um, and that was the first time that I, I stepped back into society. In, in over six years. And I'm now confined to my house, um, awaiting a new trial with inconsistent and unreliable evidence. Queens District Attorney's Office is still intending on retrying an innocent 15 year old boy. Um, the work that I'm doing, the work that I'm focused on right now is to raise awareness uh, about the injustices that is going on, um, particularly with the disproportionate low income um, seven neighborhoods that are continuously contributing um, to the prison pipeline here in New York State. And these seven neighborhoods are being targeted and oppressed. And it has been a repetitive cycle for decades now. Um, and my goal is to raise awareness, to let the people know that we have rights. We need to know our rights and utilize our rights. Um, and the legacy that I'm carrying with me today is Malcolm X. Uh, thank you. For, thank you for Kosh, man. Just so much of that energy um, yes we're going to be building more about that today um, getting deeper about that today so I thank you for opening us with that energy uh, my Asia please please sis family everything um, please tell us who you are the work you're doing and what legacy brings you here today um, so my name is my Asia and uh, I, like Alex said, I joined HAL 
our lives and go together when I was in high school. And um, it was an amazing journey. It was a difficult journey. Um, it was a lot of healing, a lot of reflection, and accountability. Um, and that led me to my own journey of starting my own business um, to give back in a different kind of way um, from the things that I learned through Hala and meeting other people. So I now own my own business called Naija Bodega Beauty. And I like to think that I'm healing by helping other people feel beautiful about their self or um, feel more confident in themselves. Um, I feel like when you get your hair done or when you get a facial or just when you take care of yourself or someone helps you take care of yourself, it leads to you having better self-care, um, better state of mind. Just all around, you just feel better. You feel more confident. You feel like you could do more. Um, and the legacy that brought me here today is Asada Shakur because when I was in Hala, she was like, along with many other leaders, she was a main part of uh, our program. And her legacy always just stuck with me. And it became a part of who I am now. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And thank y'all so much for being here with us. Um, my Asia, just want to like uplift this, what you just offered about care being like a self, care being a form of justice. Um, and also Prakash and Nana, what y'all shared about the urgency of this work right now, right? Um, and recognizing that we're having this conversation today um, and this is a, a conversation that we've been engaged in and that people before us have been engaged in and that we're like picking up the torch in this conversation. And so to just like lay this foundation and to go back to something that Alex shared in the beginning um, about this non-traditional approach, can we just take a moment to ground in our neighborhoods um, and share a little bit about like the neighborhood that you're from um, and some of what you see and experience as a young person um, in your neighborhood um, and my Asia, we're going to kick it back to you to, to start, sis. So I'm a bed star. Um, most people say bed star do a doc. Um, and it actually really does live by his name. Um, as a kid, I've seen like shootouts, even as a grown woman today. Um, I've seen shootouts. I've seen robberies. I've seen a list of things. Um, but alongside those negative things, I've also seen positives, such as people in the community trying to reach out to at-risk youth, as um, the government likes to call them. Um, I've seen schools provide, like, aftercare programs for kids, parents that can't necessarily afford it. Um, also opening up space to kids that feel like they want to join these programs, um, but felt like they're being peer pressured into other things. Yeah. Thank you for that, Maeja. Um, Nana, can we pass it to you next? Yeah. Um, so right now, you know, tuning in from Brownsville. I've been in Brownsville for about five years um and brownsville is one of you know one of those seven boroughs um that contribute heavily um to what we're gonna eventually get to talking about um the punishment system and where i'm at like i'm gonna talk about the good stuff so like community building is done through music and food you know now that it's nice out like Y'all can't really hear it, but it's music everywhere. I'm um, talking soca, dance hall, you know, like old school R&B um, and cookouts everywhere, left and right, in front of buildings, in front of um, porches, um, and all up in the park, too, right across the street. It's beautiful when, you know, that unwritten code, leave the drama at home actually happens. And, you know, we just get together and just, like, escape from like the horrors um of the world but yeah that's brownsville i 
Thank you, Nana. Really appreciate that, bringing that uh, diva love energy. Uh, Akash, uh, please tell us, um, you know, about uh, your natal and what they experienced. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Jamaican Queens, it, it's known for a lot, uh, just like the list of other neighborhoods that we had to speak about today. Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't really get a chance to experience life, um, as a teenager and as a young adult. I was behind bars, unfortunately. Um, as a result of this criminal injustice system we got here um, in America. But uh, prior to me being arrested, honestly, I, I witnessed nothing but, but violence. Um, abuse of policing within our communities, particularly um, targeting black and brown people. That's all I can remember, honestly. We appreciate that. Definitely um, thank all of y'all uh, for sharing those experiences. Yes, our neighborhoods, like we said, like, you know, I'm from seven neighborhoods too, but it, it, it's all the things we have, you know, many ways we're trying to do social and emotional learning and healing and loving on each other. Uh, that is not, that is all non-traditional because people, you know, we be doing ciphers on blocks, you know, playing tag, all types of manhunt, um, you know, so just thinking about like, like, yeah, like we live in, in, in areas where we're trying to figure out our own ways of like, trying to like create love in, in, in these uh, harsh conditions. So I definitely want to appreciate those um, those ways. Uh, and getting into our third question, uh, which is like us getting grittier, you know, us getting like to the study, to the to the to the deepness of today. Uh, the basic question. Now, the basic question was developed, like I said, by the Green Haven Think Tank in the nineteen seventies, after realizing that they were the minor in society, but the majority. With the in the prison system, so now understanding that, let me let me state the basic question: How is it that that although blacks and Latinos together make up less than twenty eight percent of the general population of New York State, while at the very same time they make up eighty five percent of the total state prison population, and over seventy five percent of that total state prison population comes from New York City. Those seven neighborhoods, like we was addressing, Brownsville, Best Eye, Jamaica Queens, Harlem, East New York, Lower East Side, South Side Bronx. How can we account for this uh, disproportionate representation? How did this happen? What are the future implications? And from this basic question that I ask, please, panelists, what thoughts come to mind after learning this basic question, after understanding what these uh, what this basic question mean, uh, how it makes us feel. Uh, Maisha, please, um, can we hear from you? Um, at first, when I heard you read that like, statistic in the breakdown, it instantly reminded me of how in history we was taught that the police academy that we know today was actually um, meant to catch slaves. Um, and just thinking about that and the foundation of what they stand on and what their policies were before they became what they are today and got like funding and political backing and this big mass media movement behind them. Just knowing that it instantly already makes it seem like there's uh, unfairness and in, in inequality um, and the people who are meant to protect and serve us um, Whereas the people that are being caught and are the criminals. Um, that was my first thought. My second thought was when you think about those numbers and you think about the community, I was always taught through Holla that we aren't the minority, we're actually the majority. Um, 
there's more black and Latino people of color than what are accounted for and what's shown in media and put out there into the public. Um, so knowing that majority of us make up the prison system and some of the crimes that we are arrested for or accused of doing, um, it's just disheartening. It leads me to think that um, in the future, a lot of black families will be broken up. Um, there will be a lack of protection for black people. Um, honestly, even now, I feel like we're not protected. We're not heard. We're not understood. Um, the biggest example that comes to mind right now is when a mass of white people stormed the Capitol and nobody was shot, nobody was killed, nobody was brought to justice, nothing happened to them. But when black people marched in front of the Capitol for what happened to Eric Gardner, for what happened to the millions of men and women that have lost their life due to police brutality. You had the National Guard on the steps with the orders to, to shoot us. They're trained to shoot and kill. And yeah. that's my thoughts. Nah, nah, thank you. Thank you for that, my Definitely. Yes. Exactly. Understanding that, like, word, our conditions are the reasons which lead us into the criminal punishment system. Uh, and these conditions were set up by, by the state. So definitely. Um, Kosh, please share. Um, it, all, it all leads back to slavery. And as decades and decades go by, the government, they just figure ways out to modernize it. For example, they removed me out of a jail cell on Rikers Island and now established a jail cell within my home. I can't work. I can't, I can't survive and provide for myself and my family right now. And that goes to show how it's just set up for failure. They know that one of the requirements uh, for me to even be out on bail on electric, electronic monitoring is that I maintain and sustain stable housing. How am I supposed to maintain a stable, how am I supposed to maintain stable housing when I can't work? I can't do nothing. I'm locked up in my house all day. Um, I truly believe that it all started from slavery. And like I said, they now modernized it. in different ways. That's, 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 that's what I think about it. Thank you. Nana, would you like to share your thoughts? Yeah. Um, immediately, I was just like, wow, there are people that are facing one of the greatest horrors on life and they're doing research, like the power in that, you know, by itself, you know? Um, and then looking at the stats, like growing up, you hear all the time, you know, yeah, you're gonna either end up dead or in jail. You gotta stay inside. Like what's outside? You know what I mean? Like, are people gonna catch us when we go outside? And that's the truth, you know, like, when our parents told us to stay inside, like, don't go out in the streets, like, what's in the streets? Why can't we go out in the streets? And the truth is, like, we are being targeted from young, um, whether it be in the schools, whether it be outside. And like Prakash said, at home, too, you know, you're just stuck there. And I feel like the conditions that are created, it doesn't make anything even better. But that's a part of the agenda. We know that. You know, um, and I'm glad that research was actually done so that we see the statistics. You know what I mean? Because we can't get it all, but we got a good idea of what the statistics are. And we can actually do something about that. You know what I mean? Um, but one step at a time, you know, 
but just wanted to honor that we got researchers, you know what I mean? Like, we got, we got scientists, you know, um, just trying to find something. Thank you, Nana, exactly, exactly. Like, from just hearing everything I was saying, just understand, like, definitely there's a war on black and brown people. You know, there's a war on us, uh, and and it's it's an un, unimaginable war, the ways that it's uh, that it comes forth and how it how it affects us and harms us. Uh, and also, we are combating against the war. Look at our elders, our ancestors, our political prisoners, our revolutionaries, our scientists, our researchers. People, what well, we did, we did research in prison. Talk about it. Talk about that. You, you, you do research in prison. See how hard it is. We was organizing each other. We just become socially conscious. We trying to uplift our people, heal our people. And every chance that we get, they try to lock us up, try to violate us. So definitely I want to uplift um, that kind of energy that like, yes, uh, we're more than just uh, people who've been enslaved and we're always been fighting and always been trying to get back. Thank you, Alex, for, for uplifting that and, and, and bringing together all of these different pieces, right, of the constellation um, of brilliance that was shared in this last question. Um, I think it's, it's really important that we have this data, right, that we are able to then map and trace the ways that specific neighborhoods have been targeted, um, because that gives us fuel and energy right, to better understand the systems that we're up against um, and to better be able to dismantle them. Um, and so this data, right, um, was just the beginning. And I think it's important for us to talk a little bit about, like, all of the ways, right, that, like, people have been organizing and thinking about what it means to combat this issue, right, but also to imagine something else, right, to be abolitionists in our dreaming, to be abolitionists in our creation, um, and this brings us, you know, to our next question, which is about young people. Um, and, you know, we want to ask our panelists, right, like, why is it important for young people to be at the center and the heart of organizing, of movement work, of healing, right? We're clear that this issue impacts young people, um, and we're clear that young people have always led movements for justice. Um, but why do you think it's important, especially right now, for young people to become activated and engaged in this fight? in this struggle for liberation. Um, and Prakash, we'd love to pass it to you first. Um, uh, the number one reason why, you know, we need to uplift and, and, and really share our knowledge and personal experience with uh, the youth and, and young adults uh, is because they need to know that there is a system designed to snatch us off the streets so they can have money in their pockets. They need to know that there is a repetitive cycle of oppression on black and brown people here, um, particularly within those seven neighborhoods um, that's mentioned. They need to know that they have right and they need to know how to utilize those rights against excessive and targeted policing because if they don't then we're just going to fall victim to the system they're just going to become another statistic to the system we don't want that my goal is to stop that to end that That's my employee. Thank you for that, Prakash. And, you know, I think what you're saying is so relevant and important, especially in your case, right? Because I think something that really grounded me and honestly even, like, shook my spirit when you were speaking in your introduction was that they're not trying you now as a 22-year-old young man. They're trying a 15-year-old Prakash, right? They're trying a 15-year-old Prakash that if had 
access to other types of resources, programs, spaces as a young person, right, that jail and prison would not have been the only option, right? And I'm thinking about the fact that we do this work for 15-year-old Prakash, right? And also for, for the you that you are now, six years later in this journey, right? Um, and for hopefully the many, many years ahead that we have you in this space to continue to tell your story as a free person. Right, we need you and we're gonna keep working until you are free, Prakash. And I just wanted to like name that and uplift that. Um, and I hope everyone who's tuning in, uh, we're gonna hear a little bit more about how we can like be a part of, of Prakash's work right now. Um, but I'm just I'm just wanting to honor that. I'm wanting to honor childhood in this moment, girlhood and boyhood um, that Nana like uplifted before, just like the joy of summertime in New York City being able to play outside in the fire hydrant or, you know, have popsicles or whatever else it is, like, is that joy of childhood that we're also like really looking to protect for our young people right now. Um, and so to build on that, Nana, like you talked about earlier, care, right? Um, and like, I'm wondering like, what's coming up for you when you're thinking about, and you've been a part of so many youth spaces, right? When you reflect on yourself as a young person in youth spaces, and now coming back and being a facilitator and a circle keeper in new spaces, like why is it important for young people to be centered and prioritized in our work? Because um, every time I think about questions like why are you, um, young people important in the work, I just think of myself as a younger, younger person. Um, like now I'm 22, but I'm thinking like, damn, what did 12-year-old Nana need? You know what I mean? Um, how could she have better been protected and feel safe? You know what I mean? A lot of things have came up in my life because I simply did not feel safe at all. There was no safe space for me. So including them and centering our work around them will be able to create adults, right? And our elders that can also feel safe. You know what I mean? I know for a hundred, I know for a fact that my mom doesn't feel safe right? And she's an elder, right? She does everything in her power to protect me, but I know she doesn't feel safe. And if she doesn't feel safe, who's going to make her feel safe? Who's going to protect her? You know what I mean? So I feel like centering about around younger people and be able to get that security and that community work for ourselves as young people. And then as we grow older, it's like, okay, we're getting closer to a safer world. You know what I mean? If I want to pour my heart out, I can feel free to do that. Um, and also the conditions will just ultimately be better because we have younger people that have hope now. You know what I mean? Like when you feel secure in your community, you have hope, you have dreams, and this is going to be better. This is, this is not forever. But when you grow older with like work not being centered around you, you to like, fixing injustices in like schools and going to a school where there's metal detectors and school safety that's just like targeting you it made me not want to trust anybody right like no one at all and I just had tunnel vision and just like want to do everything on my own but I imagine like what would it have been like if I had a secure community where I could ask people if I needed help you know what I mean I don't gotta do everything alone um, I am free to share and I'm free to receive, you know? So I always think about that, like, hmm, things could have definitely turned out slightly better, you know, had, you know, the work have been centered around young people and people just simply listening to me as a young person. Yes, Nana, thank you so much for uplifting that. Um, and for, you know, just the reminder that young people already know because young people are experts in their lives <laughs> um, and they see, right, what it means to go to school um, in spaces of surveillance, to not feel safe going to school or to constantly having to not just worry about themselves, but also worry about family members um, and the ways that they move through the world, right? And so all of that um, is especially important. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, what it means for us to be ancestors in training um, to be people who are 
in this journey, right, to, to leave this world better than we inherited it and that we found it, um, but that we're also going to be the strength and the power that, like, future activists call upon um, to be able to continue to do this work. So, Maisha, I want to pass it to you next, sis, to talk a little bit about, you know, you started in this work as a young person, as a, as a younger person, <laughs> um, and as a youth organizer. Like, what did it mean for you to be a youth organizer then? What does it mean to continue to, like, support youth leadership um, and really listen to young people, as Nana uh, pointed out? Um, well... Before Hala, I used to work at like an organization called Girls for Gender Equity. Um, and I feel like working in both of those organizations as a young person, it made me feel heard um, because I got to discuss things that I feel like I was thinking about or that I saw, but nobody really started that conversation with me or navigated um, me in a place to where I could feel comfortable to have those conversations or it was even a topic to be brought up. Um, so being a young person and having that experience, it made me want to bring other people along um, so that way they could finally find like their safe space. It may not have been where I was, but it may have been a completely different organization. And I felt like I wanted to uplift people. Um, so seeing other young people be in this field it just makes me feel like, okay, like, you're in good hands. Like, somebody's looking out for you. Somebody's guiding you in some kind of way. Um, you're getting the attention that you need. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the babies are here. The babies are here with us. <laughs> to see other people, well, I would like for more kids to be involved in this work because... I just feel like it's a privilege um, because you get to learn yourself. You get to see society for what it really is. You get to learn a little bit more than what school teaches you. Um, you learn the important things that society just doesn't want us to know. Mm -hmm. You learn how to protect yourself. You learn what it means to care for yourself, what it means to care for others. You learn to see other people, not just for superficial things, but really for who they are. Because um, I feel like before I joined these organizations, I was really quick to catch an attitude with somebody and just be like, like, what? Like, and now it's sort of like, she could be going through some things. So let me just be nice. Let me just bite my tongue and... And let me just be nice, because I don't know. Like, she could be in a household where she's getting abused, whether it be mentally, physically, or emotionally, and she meets me, and I'm this bubble of energy, and it's just like, she's not envious, but she wants that. And she doesn't have the space for it. Mm -hmm. I feel like it made me really see people. Okay, yeah. That was true. Very true. Yafia, we're so happy that you're here. Hey, y'all. Sorry I'm late. I just got off work. Well, I'm actually still here, but I just had to go in a little room. Um, but, yeah, I totally feel what she was saying, especially um, energy is very strong. So um, when you're around somebody that has that positivity, you get a different outlook on how you can manipulate the energy that you're feeling if it's bringing you down. Um, I also feel like it's important for, um, you know, youth and young adults to stay in contact because I feel like that's how rituals are passed down. That's how knowledge is passed down. Um, a lot of our elders, they know a lot of things from back in the day and a lot of old sayings that kids need to hear today. And that's how you keep knowledge and that's how you keep knowledge circulating in the circle. That's how you keep wealth. You know how it depends on how big the knowledge is. You can also create wealth throughout that whole thing. Also, with like healing, you know, I didn't really know much about healing until, you know, I joined Hala. And I met Hala um, through Drive Change. I was working um, at Drive Change, um, social justice food program. And, um, I had like immediately connected with Hala because they just spoke on things that 
you don't get to hear every day. You know, we're taught to just, you know, go through, make it happen, make it day by day. We're not really taught to take taught to take care of ourselves. And you have to take care of yourself before you be somewhere, you know, on the borderline going schizophrenic, you know, because that runs through our that runs in our community like water run through pipes. So I definitely feel like um the rituals and the healing and the knowledge is definitely important for for uh, our youth and it's important for us to see the structure of what it's supposed to be like as a colored man or a colored woman from our elders yeah. thank you so much sis for joining us um, yeah, I'm so happy to have this. yes i have your brilliance and your expertise here um and something that jayanti had talked a little bit about was ritual so we're going to get back to that um, because we definitely want to um, take some time to honor the rituals and the, the spaces that we're looking to bring into the future, right, and what we want to cultivate. But we want to take some time to, like, stay in this conversation for a moment, okay. right, just to see, mm -hmm. if, like, things that other panelists have brought up that you want to go back to or just share a little bit more about. Um, again, particularly about, like, the power of young people Right. Um, and I'm wondering just to throw another question in, into here is like, what is um, the power of like young people linking up with other young people in spaces? Right. So we heard drive change. Uh, we heard grocery under equity. Of course, Hala has been a space. Right. For mm -hmm. people. But what what's the power of young people getting together to be able to engage in these types of conversation and to organize? Um, our communities, right? Because just like our elders have knowledge, you know, I also know that there are things that young people bring home and are like, yo, mom, like, grandma, do you know that this thing is called this, right? Or could you imagine that, you know, systems of immigration are connected to police enforcement, right? And being able, we also help our families, right? Be able to be a part of this movement and have the language. And so, how do y'all see that like connecting or is there any other parts of this conversation that y'all want to bring forth that you've heard from other panelists? I definitely want to add on something though. I'm not a panelist. I'm so sorry, but I'm definitely going to speak my truth. So sorry, not sorry at all. Um, and yes, like just thinking about young people, building with young people, uh, and thinking about even myself, like, I think now that I'm this young adult, you know, 27, which is still young, please, people understand, we are still young people in our, in our 20s and in our 30s, okay? Um, but, like, being a young adult, I feel like there's a certain kind of duty that you should do, like, building with younger, younger people. Like, so, like, thinking about my nieces and my nephews, I think it really means something for me to engage and build with my nieces and my nephews. Like, like the cause we're saying, like, like we got a journey with our young people um, um, and give them our tools and, and things that, like, our thoughts. Like, like build, what are they thinking? What do you want? Um, you know, and also our, our, our young people, like our nieces and nephews and, and our young people from our block, they in the seven neighborhoods too. Of course, they experience the same stuff like us. Um, and I really appreciate, like you were saying, Nikki and Nana, like, yeah, we got to think about our, our, our 15 year old selves, our 12 year old selves, our five year old selves, um, because that's how we remember what young people really need. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, and I also wanted to share something, you know, um, young people getting together, like, like, like you mentioned nieces. My nieces are like my children. So whenever I'm with my nieces, they teach me something new. Like they just be dancing. I'm just like, wow. Like when I was your age, she's like 16 now. So I'm like, wow, when I was your age, I did not feel comfortable to be dancing in the street like this. You better go, you better, you better do that dance that I don't know how to do. Um, and it's like that freedom that they carry with them. It's so admirable, right? So I just think to like, when I'm laughing in front of my mom and she starts laughing because I'm laughing, I'm just like, wow, look at me, like helping her tap into her inner child because of how goofy I am. Um, 
and also like being a first generation American, like my parents ain't really know how to read letters. Um, so I had to do that for them. Like imagine applying for my mom's citizenship for her. You know what I mean? She probably wouldn't have been able to do it without me. Um, and it's stuff like that that should be honored. You know what I mean? Like, damn, like, you know something, but I also know a lot. And she also knows a lot. And she's younger than me, you know? Um, and also, like, I remember years ago, my niece was, like, 10. And she remembers just, like, taking a picture. And I was like, girl, you don't got no flash in here. Um, take a picture. And she's like, it's fine. I love my skin just like this. And I was just like, and this is before I started to like love my skin myself. I was just like, wow. I never, hmm. And that was just like, to this day, I remind her that like, you know, you were comfortable in your skin before I was comfortable in my skin. She's like, really? I was like, yeah, you inspired me. You definitely did. And I love that. Just wanted to say that there. I just want to say, I think there's some silence right now because we're all really sitting with what Nana just shared, right? And like the power, right? And also like, you know, one question that I like to ask adult accomplices, you know, and I, I'm continuously asking myself this as well, is like, what's something that a young person taught you recently, right? Um, and how are you going to thank them for that? And so... I just want to put it out there, like, if there's other other folks that are thinking about young people in their lives, like Nana's nieces, um, who just continue to teach us about ourselves, right? Um, it looks like it looks like we're having some moments. Does anyone want to share? Yes, I actually do. That's crazy because I was thinking in my head, like, I actually, I don't run in. Okay, so how do I explain it? So with family. Um, I'm very distant with family. Um, I don't really put up too much um, with the, you know, with the stuff. So I separate myself a lot. Um, but I have roommates, and they're all older than me. And recently he had his daughter over. And it's, it's very ironic because her birthday is like a week from mine. And she came over, and, like, we just gravitated towards each other. And I just remember... She was telling me all the things she was doing, like um, she's in dance, just like myself, like she danced and everything, and she, she's only like 11, and what stood out to me was the passion, the, 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 the drive she had, like the music, like you, when you love something, you have a fire for it, so as I'm watching her, and I'm, I'm, str I'm, I'm giving her, we was, we was talking about a dance, and I was giving her some hints and who's on like how to you know, do it or whatever. And she just taught me to, like, what I'm doing, I'm doing a damn thing. But at first, I didn't realize that because, you know, sometimes we think too much in the future. We forget about what's going on in the present, what we're doing right now. And as I'm seeing her, you know, like, she got me dancing. If you know me, I'm sometimes I'm very shy. She literally had me in that kitchen dancing, smiling, laughing, not even caring. And I, I just, actually, it just hit me. Like, I actually want to thank her because sometimes it could go away because, you know, you work in, you do this, you do that. Then you think about where you're trying to get to. But she just helped me understand, like, Jay, take your time, laugh, love, dance, make a mistake, get back up, do it again. And she's only 11 years old. <laughs> wow. Thank you for that, Nana. Like, you really just, I didn't even notice it, but... Thank you. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. I want to invite us all to just like continue to sit with that question, right? As we as we move through the next few questions that we have and hopefully hear from, from our community that's joining us on Facebook. Um, we have a facilitator chat, y'all, which is also just like filled with gems. Um, and I, I shared a few moments ago as I was like hearing Nana and now Giantia talk a little bit about like what it means to learn from young people. 
um, Albert Camus, who was a philosopher and an organizer in France, one thing that he said was, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. And so I think young people like remind us and ground us of like the possibilities of freedom before this world taught us and told us what it looked like to be unfree. Right, and so I just want to hold on to that, right? Um, I think radical imagination isn't always about imagining something that we don't know. Sometimes it's also about coming back to ourselves, right? And coming back to that, that 11-year-old version, that 12-year-old version, that 15-year-old version of ourselves um, and the freedom that's possible when we like nurture that part of ourselves. Yeah, so I'm not sure if anyone else wants to, wants to reflect on that. Um, if not, Alex has like a really beautiful question to bring us into for the next part. I just want to say one thing. This is going to be a new challenge for me, and I've never thought about this. Going back to my inner child, I forgot all about that girl. <laughs> I forgot. Like, I never, like, I, that's going to be something, but I'm going to work on that because I, I totally forget how I came to who I am today. Mm -hmm. So definitely, thank you guys. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, sis. And, you know, she didn't forget about you. Right? Because she's literally probably looking at you like, damn, like, we did it. Right? We here. Right? And probably just so proud. Right? Um, and so sit with her. You know? Let her ask you questions. You know? Let her, like, know that on the other side of all the, all the other things that have happened since then, that, like, you are where you are now. Uh, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm just in awe. Just feeling all the, all the vibes. Um, I appreciate what you were saying, Deontia. Like, she was teaching you, like, I'm doing the damn thing. And I think that's most of the times how young people be trying to tell us that. Like, we ain't listening. We ain't trying to hear it. Like, I'm doing the damn thing. Like, you see me doing it. Even if I make a mistake, like, yeah, hey, just, you know, give me some pointers. But make sure I'm, I'm letting you know I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, so definitely appreciate that energy, too. Um, you know, you know, going to move us into our next question. Um, which is uh, our last question uh, for the day. So, you know, you know, I definitely hope, um, you know, our Facebook Live audience been just getting all this love and this energy of us talking about uh, uh, the non-traditional approach, our experiences coming from our neighborhoods, um, but then also, like, us being young people and giving back to young people, what young people need in our community, what they deserve in our community, and what they teaching us in our community that they doing the damn thing, right? <laughs> so our next question, and I pass it on to you, Nana. What resources, tools, practices, and policies do you feel that young people in the seven neighborhoods right now deserve? Well, one, from what we've all been talking about, a, a dance studio. You need dance studios. These kids love to dance, and they feel free. They feel like... The world is theirs, and I feel like that is a form of expression that is ancestral. You know what I mean? Our ancestors we were dancing and, you know, just gathering all together in different forms. And I feel like dancing is really, really powerful. I feel like we need to tap into that, um, and children should have spaces to do that, you know? Yes, yes. Dance spaces, all of that. Because you know how we do with the coaches pop locking and dropping and, and shaking and baking. They don't know. We got a TikTok coming out every few seconds. What you talking about? And, you know, I'm not good and skilled, but I know my nieces and nephews, they, they all that. Talk about it. Uh, so I appreciate that. Yes, we need some music spaces. We need some dance studios and some places where we can have some dance tournaments and all that. Some, you know? So I appreciate that. Um, my next question will go to Jayant here. Please share with uh, rituals, tools, practices, uh, policies. Do you feel that young people from the seven neighborhoods deserve right now? Oh my gosh, Nana! Like dance, you really hit me with that one because I've always said, like you know, when I get to the point where I want to get in life, I wanted to build those things not only in Chicago but all over because we really do we really do need these things like those things bring us so much joy 
also, I feel like knowledge. We need true knowledge in these spaces. Like, we need to learn our real history. You know what I'm saying? Not just the Harriet Tubman's. Not I'm talking about deep. You know, we need to tap into warrior spirit and knowing how to use it. Knowing how to use our knowledge. Knowing how to use our money. I realize that we, some of us, uh, we don't have enough knowledge on money, how to spend it, how to make it work for you. Also, when we're eating, half of the things we're eating is just chemicals. And some of us, you know, we're so addicted to it that we like, oh, well. But we really need, like, spaces um, learning about just the truth. You know what I'm saying? Even though it might be hard for some people to accept it because... Yes, yes. What, what, what Nikki just said in the, how are we going to win if we're not right with them? You get what I'm saying? A lot of people don't understand these things we eat. They go to our brain, you know? Our penile gland is right here. So everything that we're eating, it could come in, all those dye in the foods and that red make five, like those things will really have you somewhere ready to cuss your mom out. And some people... That we're not acknowledging that because the food is so seasoned so good. <laughs> we just like, okay, whatever, it tastes good. You know, so I definitely feel like, you know, we need um, dance studios, um, studios where you can just come to learn about knowledge, how to spend your money, um, learn about your real ancestral. Like, I'm not talking about the basics that they taught us in school. I'm talking about things that I learned and I said, wow. You know, like the Amazon tribe, you know, Queen Nzinga. Like, I, I know that it was kings and queens out there, you know, sticking side by side, helping each other. You got science, I got food. You got this, I got this. Like, we need more of learning how to work together. I always say the same, and I'm going to leave it at that. You don't hate on your own people. You gravitate. When you see another colored person doing good, you don't go, oh, oh, shit. You don't do that. You ask yourself, well, how could I elevate myself? What could I do that's going to benefit me? So, yeah. We got to stop hating more gravitate. Nah, thank you for that, Jay. Appreciate your energy, man. And your nonverbals. I that's how it really be capturing. People people don't understand, they'll understand through your nonverbals. You understand? <laughs> so I definitely appreciate you. Uh my Asia, please share us like what do you think like uh young people from the seven neighborhoods deserve, such as resources, rituals, and practice? Um, I think they deserve more space. Um, because I feel like it's easy for, like Hala, for example, we started out in a space, and sometimes we would have to adjust our space. Um, and it didn't stop us, but it definitely slowed things down sometimes. Uh, so I feel like in the seven neighborhoods, if there could just be, I remember as a kid, I grew up going to the community center. Um, they had teen night. They had, like, young children during the day. So when I got older and I was a teenager, I still had somewhere for me to go. Um, and now they don't have that anymore. So legit, most spaces that kids create is on the corner, outside in the playground. Um, and those are seen as threats to cops. Um, that's seen as a... Oh, they're causing unnecessary noise. Um, they're disturbing the peace, especially with a lot of gentrification now. Um, white people will call for anything. Um, they could just be walking to the Chinese restaurant and they're laughing too hard, having a regular childhood experience, and it could turn into a judgmental thing to where somebody loses their life or somebody goes to jail. Um, I feel like they need more space. Um, they need more opportunities to be heard, whether that's like people get together, community leaders get together. And I remember Holly used to do like the come bullshit and talk. That was a space for people from all over to just come. Just talk your shit. Get it off your chest like Vince. Get it out because I feel like without that space, a lot of teenagers, even adults now, walk around angry. 
harboring nothing but negativity and it transpires into like everything that they do and who they are on a daily basis. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Marisa. I really appreciate that still. Um, exactly. Our young people who be on the corners, be in the, the parks, be on those, those, those different parts of the, the cut blocks. Um, we're doing social and emotional learning. We're trying to build our skills. You feel me? We're trying to build formations and, and, and create actions and ways where we can heal and, and, and love each other. You know, and definitely, yeah, like we created hip hop. We used to do ciphers on the blocks, and every time we did a cipher on the block, cops come and try to break us up. Every time we outside trying to have fun, doing things that we want to do, they come break us up. Um, we're trying to do the damn thing, and they're not understanding it. Uh, so I really appreciate you. Akash, please um, share with us your thoughts. Um, I, uh, one thing that I believe that all youth, all young adults deserve right now um, is their right against police deception. Um, and I want to say this today because Illinois is the first state in America to abolish police deception against you. I am a victim of police deception. I was 15 years old when I was dragged out of my bed, placed in an, placed in an interrogation room for hours, lied to, legally lied to by detectives. That is one of the main things that I believe youth deserve and we must demand that all New York lawmakers follow suit with Illinois. Um, the reason why I say that, man, because, for example, the exonerated five, they were all lied to. They were exonerated. That case right there was based off of a false confession. A false confession. And that's really all the government needs. That's the sad part. And that's what the government is using against me, a false confession. That's what right now got the life, a life sentence right now hanging over my head. I wake up every day asking myself, why me? I want to make sure I do everything in my power to make sure that no other youth, no other teenager has to experience what I experience. There needs to be more recreational centers in each neighborhood. There needs to be more know your rights workshops. That's all I, that's all I gotta say as well. Thank you for that, Rakash. And for, and for bringing in like the policy level vision right, of what's needed and wanted. Um, and I think it's really important that you bring in the Exonerated Five um, and the ways in which their stories as young people, I mean, the ways that they were criminalized, demonized, right, as young people um, is not unique to them. And I think we see that in your story, Prakash. But also the systems that were in place we're not abolished. So just because they are free and we're so thankful that they're free and exonerated doesn't mean all the systems that created that dynamic, right, um, and that fed into that have, they're still standing, right? That architecture is still in place, right? And so what I also hear in a lot of what people have shared um, is like, we could have all of these things, right? If the money from NYPD's budget and the money um, that is fueling mass incarceration was diverted into these into these other spaces right we actually there's actually everything that we need already right it is just completely being um pushed into right systems of harm and incarceration um and so we could have like this is possible right and i think in an abolitionist future one that hopefully right we will see in our lifetimes or our children will see in their lifetimes um is possible right like a world without police a world without incarceration, 
a world without school safety agents, right? Like all of this is, is possible. Um, and I think like all the joy that y'all were talking about before um, and the justice um, as it relates to food, as it relates to space, as it relates to the freedom of bodies to move in space safely, right? Um, that's the vision. Um, and I'm so thankful for like the clarity that y'all articulated that way. Nah, thank you, Mickey. Uh, thank you, everyone. I just wanted to share thoughts. Cause I'm bubbling. I'm like, yo, y'all just got me bubbling. When I'm bubbling, I got a pop. <laughs> um, so definitely, yes, because we need more Know Your Rights workshops, Know Your Ancestry workshops, Know Your Our Story, and, and for young people to create movement. Government, the, the America, they afraid of movement. They afraid when we, our young people, do movement work. They don't want our young people to do movement work. They don't want our young people to uplift their communities and do actions and, and, and take control and take power of their, of their leadership in their communities. They are afraid of us. That's why they put the young lords in, in, in Black Panthers in prison. That's why they was trying to violate Asada and the Black Liberation Army. Because we young and we powerful. That's why they did that to Fred Hampton. So definitely, this is... This is, this is a legacy of, 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 of the war on us, but also the power within us. And that we're going to keep, we're going to keep popping. We're going to keep doing what we need to do. And yes, exactly. We need policies and as well as community-specific approaches that protect our young people. One thing I was thinking about, you know, I used to, I used to bang. I used to be blood, and I appreciate blood, love, um, and, 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 and the ways that it was created and the things that, 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 that that, that, that has struggled to be. Specifically, though, how are people who are in the communities who have this type of um, this type of status, how are you building with young people? How are we protecting our young people in our community? If we got all the power in our communities, we, we, we're looked up to because we these big homies or big sisters and such, how do we make sure our young people is protected all the time? How are we sharing them their rights and letting them understand and do study? So, you know, I'm just trying to throw that out to, to the universe, to our other people, our audience who's watching, um, whoever may pick that up. Wait, repeat the question again? Was it a question or? Oh, well, the question that we was talking about was, uh, was about the resources. And, and, and policies and practices. So if you still have something to share, you could please share it. No, I wanted you to repeat your ending. Oh, it, was, no. it was something good I thought of, but I forgot. No, no, go, go. So I was definitely stating that, uh, yeah, like how are we in our communities who have power, accessibility, love, connection, how are we um, protecting our young people in our communities? I feel like I feel like what we up against is really like we gonna have to do some work, <laughs> like some work, work. Cause I'm realizing, cause like I'm pretty sure it's a few of us that's into music. I'm realizing that there's actually not a lot of good influence, and it's like how do we freak that into a positive note? Like how do we get back into that era? of, um, you know, Queen Latin, MC Light, um, you know, back in that era where rap, music, we was explaining our truth. I'm pretty sure y'all are here today, music, and it just, just don't make sense, you know? But it's like the, the gag is, I feel like what we up against, we got, we just got a lot more work to do. When it comes to code, you know, secrecy, we need to learn how to keep our mouths, you know, we, we like to gossip. Oh, we gotta learn secrecy, cold, when to talk, that signal. Who, you know what I'm saying? Cause I feel like things are just gonna get realer and realer. From this point on, every month that's gonna happen in this year and next year, our faith is gonna be put to the test. Is we gonna come together or are we still gonna keep fighting amongst each other? Cause people don't understand the wealth is in here. It's in this chat right here. This is where the wealth is at. But, you know, I don't know. I got a lot of things coming to my mind, but 
we definitely got some some work to do. And I just want to tell y'all to like, whatever y'all want to do in life, like, please do it. Because I need to be inspired. I have my days where I'm like, am I doing good? Am I doing right? And I need my peers. I need y'all to stay, like, do what y'all got to do. And I'm going to continue doing what I got to do because we need that inspiration. No matter how strong we want to be, how overly independent we want to be, we need each other's inspiration. And we need it the correct way. Like, yeah, money is fine. That's cool and all. But ain't nothing like having a system. Ain't nothing like having, you know, Alex and Corey, I can come have a space to and talk to and then something ain't feeling right. Ain't nothing where I can go to my therapist, Priscilla, and I can go hit her up and talk about something. That makes me feel great. It makes me feel like I have something. I, that makes me feel like I have an army behind me. And I feel lucky. I feel privileged. But I, we need a lot of more people need this. And we got to set the tone for them. I'm, I'm moved by so much in this moment, right? I think the, the grounding that, like, we have each other, right? Like, we got us, right? And, you know, one of the ways that we wanted to, to close out, we're not closing yet, right? Like, we have, I think, a lot more brilliance to share. Um, but this feels like a good invitation or a good opportunity. Is like, how can people get involved, um, right? So how can we be involved in each other's work? What do we have going on um, in terms of ongoing campaigns, organizing, entrepreneurship, other youth spaces? Like, how can we um, activate this base of, of power and of community towards, like, continuing to do this work together? Um, because, like you said, Jay, like, we need each other, right? And none of us, like, what we're up against is not bigger than we are, right? But, like, we, we have some work to do to get organized. Um, and so just as an invitation, right, for those of us on this call, like, want to give some space for people to share. How can people get involved in your work? Um, and Prakash, want to pass this to you first, brother, because we know that you have an ongoing case um, and that there's very, very specific ways that folks can show up, whether you're in New York or if you're if you're tuning in from like from nationally right now, um, can show up and support Prakash. Uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely, uh, you know, different, different ways you guys can get involved and, and contribute to my, to my fight and struggle for justice and freedom. Um, number one, I have a petition on change.org. Um, the title of the, the title of the petition is hashtag free Prakash Truman. Um, I have a GoFundMe. GoFundMe is hashtag free Prakash Truman. Um, and my alliance and I, uh, we've been conducting a Zoom phone zap every week, every Wednesday, to the Queen's DA's office, demanding that she permanently drop all the charges against me. Um, I, I have all the information on all social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I'm going to look into that definitely. Um, I also wanted to say that, because, you know, today's kids, um, they're a little different. Um, I feel like just by us, I don't want to say promoting ourselves, but showcasing the things we're doing on the media. So, for instance, me, I usually post, like, the, the, the things that I'm feeling on Instagram, but I just recently moved to Snapchat, too, because... That's where a lot of the trauma starts. Like on my Snapchat, I got a lot of people from the hood in Chicago, down south. And just recently, um, some strange happened to me. And at first, I wasn't going to post the, the, the video because I'm like, people on my Snapchat platform, they won't understand. Because, you know, I just thought maybe because they all from the hood, they, they, they chakras just blocked, so they're not going to pay attention. But a part of me was like, you never know. Just give it a shot. Just say what you feel and everything. And I'm not going to lie, y'all. I posted that video, and I said what I said. And you could tell a lot of people was moved. Mind you, these are people that still doing the same things that we used to do when I was back home. And the fact that, that they just gravitated towards it and reached out to me, like, 
what you said was real, I'm pretty sure after seeing that video, they're going to have a lot of questions about things. And I just feel like when you on this journey, it's a, it's it's important to to like show it, showcase it, put it on your social media, be in your bag and don't worry about nobody else because people are going to gravitate to you regardless, regardless. So I just feel like, yeah, like showing what we do, showing, showing the works, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm getting used to using my platforms for the things that Jayantia do. Not only am I um, a dancer, not only am I um, part of this organization, but I am who I am and I want my platform to showcase that. You get what I'm saying? And there's people on my platform where they know the ruggish J, they know the old J. But they looking at this, and I'm pretty sure they're thinking, like, wow. Like, I know if this girl, nah, let me figure something out. And that's all. Like, we got to show, we got to just show what we doing. Not to flaunt it, but to just pass on the word, pass on the knowledge. Because, like I said again, when you in your bag, they're going to gravitate. Especially the people that just want change. Because you can't force people. And that's another thing. This generation, I've learned, you can't put it out there on them like that. Because then they... They they shy away like oh, I ain't really I ain't really with all that I ain't I ain't trying to heal right now you get what I'm saying so you just gotta do your thing showcase it and they're gonna come to you even the people that don't want to say it out loud they're gonna come to you on a low like hey I think I want to do it you get what I'm saying so yeah. Yeah, you have no idea the ripple effect. Right, that you might create and sharing your truth and sharing your story. Even the folks that might just be scrolling through Facebook, right, who stumble upon this conversation, right, and that every single conversation that they have the rest of the day is different, right? Um, or even the, the questions, like Jantia, you talked about before, the questions that people ask themselves might be different because of over overhearing and listen, listening into this conversation, right? So thank you. Um, Anyone else want to share, like, other things that people can get involved in, organizations that you want to show love to or shout out? Um, so this week, Sunday, I'm having a pop-up shop. It's going to be my first ever pop-up shop. Um, and the location is 226 West 145th Street. New York, New York. Um, doors open at 2 p.m. until 8 p.m. Um, I'll be standing there giving love and light <laughs> um, and selling my hair oil, as well, um, my homemade hair oil, um, as well as my edge control and um, the other products that I've been working on, such as my bonnets and things of that nature. Okay, okay, I have so many questions. So what day is this? It's Sunday. This oh, Sunday. Okay, okay, Sunday. What time does it end? It ends at 8 p.m. I see you. Nah, thank you, Ma. Yeah, y'all better go get that. Y'all better go get that. Better show up Sunday, man. Word, Ma. Ma is dope, man. She be doing amazing hair, y'all. Y'all better set up some appointments, y'all. And I just wanted to quickly um, shout out Breathe, you know, where I am, the holistic wellness coach. Um, it's like the first organization where I'm just like, oh, wow, I'm a coach. You know what I mean? Like a holistic wellness coach where I can tap into like herbal powers and like learning how to heal people through herbs and I've just been like working with that and like doing my research. I got like a herbal collection and like that organization is gonna give me the space to like help people heal. Um, those are my sisters, you know? Um, so I just wanted to quickly shout that out. Um, and I also wrote a book, you know, it's an affirmation book. Y'all could check it out. Um, Releasework.com is out there. Um, I've been writing for a long time and I I finally, you know, dropped the book. So check it out. You said releasework.com? Yeah, work with an E. 
Okay, W O R K E. W E R. Oh, W E R K. Oh, okay, got you. Got you. All right, get that info. Get that info. Thank you so much, Nana. Uh, just to share some too, you know, Holla got a documentary. You know, we dropped it last year. It's still on our Holla pay on our Holla TV uh, uh, YouTube page. So please go see that. Go get that. Uh, we also dropped our album about like two years ago. Also, y'all can go get that. Go listen to that. You feel me? It's for the community. It's for our seven neighborhoods. It's for healing. It's for building. Um, and please hit us up. Hit us up. You want to build. You want to. Uh, I said, Holla, we're doing a lot of dope um, uh, grassroots, non traditional healing centered youth development work, which is like, you know, us reading the side of books, um, creating movements, being outside, building with our communities. Um, we're going to start doing a lot of uh, 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 things with the arts and music outside, so I hope people come outside, too. Um, also, like I said, you know, love hip-hop. Uh, I'm an artist, Al Toro. Uh, my album is dropping October 15th. You understand? The same day the Black Panthers was started, you understand? So please, you know, go check me out. SoundCloud, Al Toro, all of that is coming Also, y'all got to hear track number seven off the album Hollas called Issues. That's my favorite one. And um, also, <laughs> It's Getting Cold Outside um, by Alex. Alex is my favorite rapper, y'all. So, like, show us, support him. Just like, I mean, when we talk about conscious hip hop and rap, um, like he is it. And so I can't wait for like an in-person show so we can show up um, and be there with you. Out to a row. Beautiful. Uh, so this has been just like, this has filled me with like the fuel that I need. Um, and just to continue to stay in this work um, to stay in this fight, to continue to imagine and dream and work for liberation. And so I'm so thankful. Um, and in the beginning, we talked a little bit about, well, now there's an invitation in the chat for Alex to drop some bars. Okay. So <laughs> um, in the beginning, uh, we talked a little bit about who we were honoring and bringing into the space and my Asia um, so that she was bringing in the energy of Asada Shakur. And so we want to make sure that that energy is present in the space. Um, and that we bring in our elder in Cuba, all our siblings in Cuba, all of our comrades in Cuba, um, that they're here with us. And so we're going to pass this to my Asia to close us out with some power. Okay, so I don't know where everybody is or if you can or cannot scream. So we don't have to scream if y'all don't want to. But um, we say the chant three times. Um, and the first line is, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And then we're going to say it again. This time, get a little louder. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Now the third time, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Look, I was like, one more time, my age, one more time. <laughs> Just one more time, write it down. Nah, thank you so much. Do you need me to say it again? Yes, yes. Okay. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We must we love have and protect nothing each to other. Lose. We have nothing to lose but our change.
Uh, thank you so much, Maesha, for bringing us out this energy. Yo, this panel was amazing, y'all. Everybody from our communities, please go see this. It will be on our YouTube probably in the next few days. Thank you, Bakash. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, Maesha. Make it six. Thank you so much. Yo, this was amazing. I love all of y'all. Um, please, please stay tuned, y'all. Next week, we got another webinar coming. The fourth one. All right, we got five. The fourth one. I hope y'all, I hope y'all, y'all, y'all keeping track. All right, there's a lot of wisdom that's been dropping. We went from the from from the non-traditional approach to healing justice, the seven neighborhoods. Next week, we talking about generational healing. We talking about healing between the generations, how young people and elders is healing between each other, how they gonna be building between each other. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I just really want to thank y'all, tell y'all I love y'all. Like, I just met my Asia today. I just met Prakash today. Who else? Where did the other girl go? Got to get her name. Nana, Mickey. I just met all y'all today, and I just want to say, like, I don't know y'all, but I love y'all. Like, I love y'all. Like, just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's just continue. We love you, Jay. We live still, but hey, we're gonna stick right here, you know. So we did that, we did the damn thing, right? We did the damn thing. Yeah, it's master us, master us. I was always trying to reach it, reach it, reach it to the motherfucking stars. Trying to reach places we ain't approached yet Even though that we was broke doesn't mean we was hopeless When we had no toast or strudels, we was eating hostess Shit, I'm grateful for them days, got me going through emotions Grandma always had them prayers, yeah, to hold us down Every time I messed up, her tough love, it came around I played a crib to let you know that I was safe and sound And even though I start no shit, no, I ain't play around Yeah Cause in this life, nobody chosen. You gotta get it like you got it going. You gotta hit it, then keep it rolling. Even in the morning when the crow's crowing. Even in, even when the sun folding. Anytime you can see that moment, gotta let it out. What you be holding? That's what happens when you catch your soul. is trying to reach it. Reach it. Reach it. To the motherfucking stars. Reach it. Reach it. I was trying to go hard. Reach it. Reach it. I was always trying to Reach it, reach it, reach it, reach it, reach it. As a youngin', I took told to reach the top of the shelf. I asked for help, but then I did it all by myself. I put the pen to the paper till my fingers would melt. And then I tapped it in the being called knowledge of self. That's the type of trap I be in when I get to the wealth. I play my cards, but I can never show the hands I was dealt. I live my life where it will test you right out for real. And if you're not in that field, you cannot own no skills. We your own. Securities can get you killed. I got nine, nine problems, but being the best ain't one. Gotta discipline yourself, manifest, and become. My spirit bomb has the power, one fifth of the sun. Don't have the God spin your block and show you how it's done. Cause I was always trying to reach it. I was always trying to reach it. Reach it. Reach it. To the motherfucking stars. Reach it. Reach it. I was trying to go.
I'm Aaron Rodriguez. I'm a junior at U. This will report back, this will report back. Giving you all facts, better call smack going on wax. This will report back, 